It's such a pleasure to uh, be joined by uh, Tracy in this crime of uh, walkie-talkie. Uh, and uh, it's such a rare uh, situation for me as a curator of an institution, of a public institution, to talk uh, with a collector, a private collector. And those conversations are happening not too often. Uh, therefore, uh, I myself going to be enjoying it very much. Uh, I didn't know that uh, at the beginning um, this uh, session will be sort of about us if uh, we should follow what uh, Abasek uh, suggested, that we should mention uh, who we are and what uh, we are dealing with. Um, we decided to make it logistically uh, nice and compact. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we selected four galleries uh, that are uh, situated uh, one next to each, uh, another. So we're not going to be walking uh, through the fur or alleys of the furs, but we're going to be passing through a very specific neighborhood uh, uh, in the fur where uh, four wonderful galleries are being accumulated. And the works are also linked. And the works are, of course, very connected, and it's a beautiful coincidence or maybe just a destiny. So uh, can we start from just uh, talking about uh, what does collecting mean for you? Um, what does collecting mean? Um, I think collecting is, is time, place, and manner. I think it, it, you know, it represents moments in time, whether you choose to look historically or whether you choose to look right now and kind of relating to those. And I think some of the works we've chosen, because they're in the 70s and then we've got some newer works, kind of speaks to that. And some of them you know, are representing historical moments in time, like some of the feminist work, and it's very relevant now. So a lot of those voices and a lot of those ideas are you know, both past and present. Wonderful. Can I ask just a private question? When you yourself started to collect, and yes. what was the work that really uh, um, generated this enormous passion that you actually decided to pay for it, to buy it, and to uh, include it within your private environment? Um, again, I think it is, first, kind of the experience that you have with the work, just physically, um, and your reaction and response to it. But then I think also when you learn the other layers, you learn what the artist was trying to achieve, you learn the context within which it's made, um, it, with it exhibited. Once you start looking at all those things, I think it makes it more interesting and more meaningful. And you're interested in kind of keeping that moment with you. So it's very much about building relationships yes. with the artists, with the artwork itself. And, and uh, with the galleries and kind of with the museums. I believe in wonderful. supporting the entire ecosystem. I understand that coming to the art fair uh, is a very important uh, moment in uh, looking at uh, art, artworks, doing research and uh, trying to find something that you like. Yes, I mean, I, I think it's a great way to get a global snapshot. Um, depending on what region you're in. And so, for instance, as I mentioned, I'm, I live in Los Angeles, so I support local artists, which I think is important. So part of that is my collection. I've also, over the last five, six years, gone to Latin America quite extensively. That's what my project was based on. My family's from Puerto Rico, so again, there's threads and commonality. Um, but one of the benefits of coming to a fair like Artissima is I get exposed to Eastern European artists, more Italian artists, Russian artists, and artists that I'm not as familiar with. So it's an opportunity to visit galleries I know and work that I'm you know, want, responding to, but also to explore new works. And here we are, because she's coming so, from so far away, we decided to actually uh, focus on uh, the geography that Tracy is not so much familiar right. with and, and the arts. Uh, that, and that's uh, your expertise and your background. So I thought it was an opportunity for me to get an inside look um, and behind the scenes information on work that I'm not as familiar with. Fabulous. So we're basically going to offer you a journey through Austro-Hungarian Empire, if you don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> and I hope you're going to enjoy it. I myself uh, come from Poland. Uh, at this moment, I'm based in Prague, and I'm the chief curator of the National Gallery in Prague. Uh, this is a collecting institution, uh, 220 years old, uh, and consists of five collections from old masters through prints and drawings, Asian and African art, 19th century, down to really impressive, modern and very embarrassing Temporary. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yes. So uh, this is the gallery um, Steineck from Vienna. Uh, there is a beautifully curated exhibition uh, that consists of three female artists. And uh, female art production uh, is going to be um, also the topic of uh, our tour. 
we're going to present you mainly 99% uh, work of female artists. For me, is a lot of it deals with, um, you know, power and structure and dominance and questioning, um, you know, uh, power structures, which is, this, all these works were done in the 70s. And I feel like we're we're dealing with those issues right now, kind of in this kind of in the same way. So I feel like it's it's again dealing with that kind of past and present being really relevant. That's a very good point because actually this is an exhibition with a title. The title is Vivace, Vivas, or uh, that refers to something that is alive, that is vivid, that is uh, you know resilient, that is uh, still valid and uh, operating, and it's important for us at this moment. It also refers, as I read in the um, uh, press release materials, to Plan Viva, Vivas uh, in French, which basically means uh, the the, the plant that is uh, sorry, the plant that is uh, uh, that resists uh, the climate, that resists. Uh, all you know seasons in the year so they lives forever and this is the work of those artists uh, that is really so topical as Tracy said and uh, so valid uh, although it was done in the 70s by selecting those three artists we would also like to kind of uh, turn your attention uh, unlike the 80s uh, in uh, back to the uh, future with the production from the 70s and we're going to be also moving towards the contemporary with other proposals the first position it's by Natalia LL. She is the oldest artist from uh, this group, born in 1937. An absolute icon, crown dam of uh, uh, European or global neo avant-garde in the 60s and mainly in the 70s in Poland, in the Polish city of Wroclaw. Uh, pioneered uh, groundbreaking radical performances focused on her own female body and sexuality and nudity uh, and the, the and body as the surface of the political message. They all have a similar thread and the fact that all these women were in different countries and kind of creating very similar work using a very similar language. They each have a distinctive style and nuance whether it's kind of bringing in a male perspective or you know, they're a little bit different, but they all have that kind of same feel. And if you're making reference to the United States with Judy Chicago and kind of all of these things that were happening at the same time, it's kind of interesting. Natalia LL, you certainly know her work because a very iconic image of her so-called consumer art appeared on the cover of Flash Art and many other international art magazines already in the 70s. Eating banana, the consumer art. Here we deal with animal art. Again, the kind of provocative uh, uh, female gesture where the sexuality, where the identity uh, is being foregrounded. And all this is happening in the, regi in the time of the regime during the communism in the country uh, called Poland or in Central Eastern Europe. She became an icon very uh, important for uh, generations of uh, younger artists. By saying this, we move to uh, the artist uh, that is represented here by the series of photographs. And she was born uh, in uh, 1955 in Prague. But in 1968, uh, uh, she, together with her parents, or the parents uh, took her to Canada and she studied in Vancouver. She uh, currently based in Toronto. And here again, there is a, a very strong identity politics uh, topic, uh, but uh, somehow the body becomes a kind of uh, accessories of uh, a certain uh, technical, mechanical uh, element. And, uh, and again, a kind of... Uh, irony, the way uh, the irony had been used for the provocative performances of uh, Natalia LL is at operation. So you see here uh, when the, the, the female body again is kind of being overlapped with the skin of the male body or the animal body. And uh, maybe you also know very, very iconic image of uh, a work by uh, Jana Sterbach from, uh, the, uh, from early 70s uh, with the, the, the costume made out of uh, meat, animal meat. So this is again the kind of body as a political surface for voicing uh, radical issues uh, that uh, were not really easily acceptable at that time during the regime. Mm -hmm. uh, in other countries as well, but kind of amazing that this work was being done at that time. Um, as 
Tracy mentioned earlier the inertia of uh, the, the male position or uh, in this phallocentric context is very important for uh, all those three artists. In Jana Sterbach we see this uh, um, portrait of a generic man with uh, the, the coat, bar, bar coat uh, tattooed on the neck of of the man. The, the work of Jana Sterbach is very much about the failure. You see here those uh, uh, forms of the chair uh, where the seed is made of ice and the ice is melting. Uh, here the hand that is uh, made dysfunctional. Uh, and uh, uh, last but not least, the statement uh, from Voltaire that says that I decided to be happy uh, and uh, this is all for my own health. Uh, last position in this trilogy is Renate Bertelmann. Renate Bertelmann was born in 1943 in Vienna, where she is still based. Uh, and here uh, there is a politics of love. Uh, the, the, in the early 70s, um, Renate Bertelmann started a project uh, Amo Egito Sum, Sum Egito, uh, which, co which consisted of three parts pornography, utopia, and irony. And all of them are intertwined within the relationship because the irony is very important in the way she is uh, kind of deconstructing the phallocentric uh, uh, discourse uh, that dominated uh, art history, uh, not only through the 20th century, uh, and uh, mocks it in a way. So uh, she is kind of combining the seriousness of a discourse with a domesticity of this discourse by, for instance, doing this, which is called washing day. So the latex, which she started to use in the 70s as a sort of equivalent of the human, possibly female skin, uh, becomes a kind of uh, material that uh, uh, through this kind of historical, it's very much about a historical male, historical female, sorry, uh, is kind of uh, uh, expressed in, uh, in the multiplicity of uh, uh, body parts uh, or um, uh, body accessories that are connected with sexuality, with eroticism. Um, uh, p p yes, possibly you know that uh, those two artists, Natalia LL as well as Renate Bertelmann, participated in a um, uh, recently very known uh, um, exhibition within another art fair called Freeze, and it was a show called Sex Work, uh, which was curated by Eilis uh, Ginger Ass. Maybe, and this is maybe, I, I'm not as expert as Adam is, but maybe considering everything that is uh, happening right now in the United States, uh, particularly with the Harvey Weinstein issue and a lot of uh, discussion about women and being sexualized, uh, you being from Los Angeles, what is the kind of discourse that is happening? Have you been hearing art, younger artists in Los Angeles, since I know you're connected to so many, discussing this, and is that affecting their work? Are you seeing that? I mean, it's affecting a lot of people's work in a lot of industries. It is very topical, uh, you know, considering the entertainment industry is, is, is based in Los Angeles. And it's a lot of the same ideas and concepts dealing with power structure and dealing with kind of an embedded power structure, kind of a cultural patriarchal structure, and kind of recognizing that we have not moved that far since the 70s. Um, I do think that artists are getting engaged. There was the article in the LA Times, but I think they're using words, and they're really trying to use words and use um, solidarity and use ways to help and support each other versus just commenting and documenting. I think that will come later. Um, because I think that's in process now. Um, but I do think that women are recognizing that there needs to be a stronger, more consistent effort on a structural basis. Um, so I'm sure that the work that's been done here, you know, is, is kind of a foundation for people. Uh, I also want to say that um, it's very important to... Um, uh, to raise attention to this uh, radical feminist work in terms of collecting on both public and private level. So uh, us in uh, Prague, we are thinking about this uh, or thinking about this anew in a way to, in order to fill up the gap uh, and uh, uh, complement our collection, the narratives with uh, this work, which was pretty uh, omitted. Uh,
I mean, I mean, to that point, just the show that's currently in Los Angeles at the Hammer Museum is Radical Women. And so a lot of the, do it's documentation of female artists in Latin America that were discussing a lot of these similar issues. And I know some of those works are being acquired, but it's very important work. And a lot of it was performance-based and documentation. And again, to your point, it's something that really needs to be looked at and institutionalized. But would you agree from your observations um, that uh, this work uh, done by female artists had already found its own place uh, within the museological uh, public institutions context or and there needs to be uh, another research, another work done? And I think we are grateful to uh, the gallery uh, of Steinek uh, for doing this amazing job by uh, casting the light on this very important work. I absolutely agree with you, and I think there's a lot of women that were working in the 70s and 80s that have not gotten recognized. So I do think it's important for everyone to look at the work when it's at fairs, to look at the work for the institutions, and for the collectors to reach out and start you know, making sure that these people um, are part of the canon going forward. I also want to say that um, not only a feminist aspect is important for uh, this work, but also very strong performative aspect. Uh, all those artists here uh, are um, uh, sort of, in a way, prototypes of the performance work or uh, that the performance uh, of the identity, in a way, and this is visible very much in the um, uh, case of Natalia Elel as well as Renate Bertelmann with uh, her uh, kind of masquerade-like, uh, very theatricalized, uh, um, erotic, sexual, uh, provocative uh, situations. Uh, and we would like to introduce you to the work of uh, another Polish artist. Uh, and we move from the 70s uh, to now, in a way. Uh, Agnieszka Polska was born in 1985 uh, in Poland. She is based in Berlin at this moment, and maybe you heard the big groundbreaking news. She just received uh, the prize of the National Gallery uh, in Berlin, uh, National, uh, Prize de Nationale Galerie, um, for the artist um, being based in, in Germany. Strangely. Interesting because now we go from, you know, kind of the older generation to a much younger generation. And there's there's threads, but there's definitely a different perspective, which I think is interesting. So. And we're still going to make a detour to the 70s to another yeah. Polish uh, position that is uh, behind the wall. But with Agnieszka Polska, um, the topic of the history of the entire 20th century is extremely important. Maybe you know her work, or remember your work from the Venice Biennale, from the main pavilion, uh, where um, uh, the work on, uh, uh, on the reception, on the historical reception of important uh, art so, uh, is uh, presented. So I think, uh, in a way, what we discussed uh, by uh, analyzing those positions uh, omitted during the time when uh, the work was produced uh, is very relevant to uh, the interests of Agnieszka Polska. Agnieszka Polska is mainly a video maker, and uh, we can say that uh, she kind of belongs to the post-internet, uh, very um, uh, fashionable uh, uh, term, uh, the generation of artists that are interested in computer-generated images of the images that are being uh, appropriated from data banks, the images that are being manipulated and uh, uh, becoming animations or they incorporate different aesthetics uh, within uh, the frame of the, of the video work. Uh, this is the most recent work by uh, Agnieszka Polska, which is called What the Sun Has Seen. What the sun has seen is a poem by a late 19th century um, female um, Polish poet Maria Konopnicka, which uh, the poem narrates uh, 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 the story uh, recited by the sun when the sun, while the sun is traveling through the day and uh, looks down uh, uh, from up uh, at the earth and uh, observes what's happening uh, on this uh, planet. Uh, and this is, these are the images of the family, the images of industry, the images of uh, um, uh, information consumption. So it's alluding to Natalia L.A. is the information and knowledge consumption that is very uh, important for uh, Agnieszka Polska. Her work is unfortunately in a similar way to Renate Bertelmann very ironic because her diagnosis of the contemporary reality is very pessimistic and very negative. So 
the viewer are hopeless or passive in a uh, it's very much Walter Benjamin-like version of the history, the angel of the history in a way. Um, so there's always a kind of suspense in her work, the kind of uh, uncanny aspect of being on the edge of life and death. And the animation technique really helps you to create this uh, sort of atmospheric aspect. It's a work that uh, uh, very much refers to uh, who we are at this moment and, uh, uh, and it generates a reflection upon this. Uh, by saying that, uh, we would like to invite you to continue unfolding uh, the historical narrative uh, for Central Eastern Europe, uh, yet another position from Poland, and this is a collective which is called Kwiekulik. It is composed of uh, um, Zofia Kulik and Przemysław Kwiek, who by merging their last names became one a private as well as artistic identity. Um, between 1971 and uh, 1982, they created a, a huge body of work that questioned uh, in a very radical way, of course, the regime in Poland, the political situation, um, and the very private, domestic, personal, family level, and the political. So kind of personal was uh, becoming a metaphor of uh, the communal. You know, there was this you know, magazine that was in Poland that was, you know, propaganda during the Cold War that basically, you know, showed this utopia in the United States kind of on the other side as being, you know, beautiful, happy, wonderful, kind of the dream. And it was kind of being sold to all these people in communist Poland that, you know, it didn't, didn't have that, that kind of uh, opening or opportunity. This is in a way an irony of what in Poland but also in other uh, Central Eastern European countries was called American Dream. We always looked at your country as uh, the ideal uh, place where we all want to be and we wanted to smuggle ourselves to your country, not anymore, <laughs> uh, I think, especially not now. But uh, this is also what uh, the uh, official uh, information agency um, that was operated by the American embassy in Poland uh, distributed with this magazine uh, in Polish language. You see colorful, you know, uh, showing this very happy, smiling person uh, and trying to uh, promote this uh, really happiness uh, while uh, the shit was happening, of course, in, uh, in that part of Europe at that time. And uh, that was absolutely opposite. So uh, the reality was black and white. Uh, and those two artists, also with a very uh, uh, strong performative um, uh, tendency, uh, kind of made a mockery of what they looked through and saw while browsing or paging uh, America magazine. So you see them pretending to have a really very happy family life with a child. Here they are really very happy artists, very successful. And uh, here they are posing somewhere in front of an institution. Here they are of course enjoying traveling through Europe. And this is also, this is for me like the most funny and ironic because that's what communists uh, um, kind of uh, try to impose or present to us as a kind of top of our dreams. The Fiat produced here in Torino, yeah, uh, 125. Uh, uh, and this was according to communism, you know, like uh, if you got it, uh, then you should have been, you know, happy until the end of your life. So you see this, they apparently traveled to Castle because that's the Neue Galerie, you know, they went to Documenta uh, with this car, which was a really a challenge, you know, to take car like this too. But anyways, the whole family was supposed to be squeezed inside of this little kind of box of a uh, uh, communist dream. And maybe you remember those artists from Documenta mainly uh, because uh, uh, the domestic life and the child uh, was also very much uh, uh, incorporated within their performances of staged uh, photographs uh, um, where the utopia of uh, another world uh, uh, had been very much uh, sort of um, introduced as, a, as, a, as an uh, endless dream or uh, we would like to move uh, from Central Eastern Europe to the place Tracy is coming from. And uh, we would love to turn your attention to this incredible series of photographs by um, Greg, Greg Crawford. So uh, Greg Crawford was a contemporary of Louis Baltz and lived in Los Angeles. 
and was friends with all the artists that were making and producing work at the time, Ed Ruscha, um, John McLaughlin, and they would call when they were having shows and they would say, please come and, you know, take take shots in, of my show, you know, uh, for the catalog or for, um, you know, just to document it. And so he did that. So he was more known as kind of a studio photographer, not necessarily a fine photographer. But if you see in his own photography, you have references. His contemporaries were also Frank Gehry. So, you know, you've got these architectural references and you have these painting references and the framework and the perspective and the lighting and the space that is very representational of the work that was being done at the time um, and kind of incorporates and blends them together. And these were done in the 70s. Um, and the gallery, you know, had been speaking um, with Gray and, you know, said, hey, he's been archiving them. So they said, all right, we'd like to see if we can actually show these works because they in and of themselves are, you know, beautiful works, not just documentation. That's true. I think uh, this is also a historical moment because uh, they are being seen almost for the first time. Uh, Timothy Persons, who is uh, the gallerist, the dealer, um, uh, a founder of the gallery, Tyke, um, uh, is a very important researcher uh, who mainly is focused on the so-called Helsinki School of Photography. This is uh, his term, this is his uh, um, focus, and uh, he had done a tremendous job uh, and research uh, by publishing five or even six volumes uh, uh, and turning uh, the world's attention to uh, the, f the phenomenon of the Finnish or the Scandinavian photography and we are actually surrounded by uh, uh, those photographs. Uh, we have no time to talk about uh, other artists, um, however, uh, if you have time please uh, don't forget. Uh, yes, as Tracy said, um, uh, those photographs are coming from the end of 70s. Uh, they had never been shown. Uh, last year, uh, uh, Timothy presented it during the Gal Berlin Gallery Week uh, uh, for the first time and convinced Gray to, to uh, cast the daylight on it. And th this is important to cast the daylight on it. This is a series called Umbra, the shadow. And uh, I think uh, he is uh, as much photographer as he, as he is a painter, uh, because the, the, the brush is the sunlight, and the sunlight is the real one as well as the fake one. So basically the surface of the photograph uh, is uh, the canvas uh, for the light and for the camera to dance, to be choreographed within it. So it's a combination of uh, something which is conceptual, something which uh, is also narrative, uh, uh, and um, something which is extremely poetic. Yeah? The poetry uh, is a huge uh, and an extremely important component uh, of this work. By uh, having introduced uh, poetry, I would like to <laughs> take you to our last uh, artist and the last gallery just around the corner. We move from Berlin to Hungary, yes? So our tour through uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire ends in Budapest. Uh, this is the gallery of Ani Molnar, a uh, fairly young gallery. Um, and uh, I also have to say that uh, the private galleries uh, um, world and community in Budapest and in Hungary in general plays extremely important role at, at this particular moment uh, in the political uh, context of Hungary, we all know what does it mean, uh, the current political situation in Hungary for public institutions that basically disappeared. So it's a great challenge uh, and a role uh, in the hands and minds of private gallery. And uh, we would like to um, conclude this presentation with uh, the last position uh, uh, by a female artist. Uh, and, uh, this artist is called Sari Ember. Uh, Sari Ember was born in 1985 in São Paulo, uh, but uh, she is she moved uh, very quickly with her parents to Hungary, and she is uh, based in Budapest at this moment. She studied in the Academy uh, Moholy Nash in Budapest. She studied photography, but what she is doing here with this uh, installation is in a way a sort of extended photography towards three-dimensional environment uh, where uh, the portraiture mainly portraiture as Jean is being deconstructed. Use of the objects and its light and space I think is, is really interesting. I think this is a very poetic uh, assemblage 
of objects uh, where one material morphs into another uh, and uh, the narratives are collide uh, and uh, also uh, the functions of the materials, the functionality and dysfunctionality, design and uh, uh, an artwork uh, become one. You even have like the portraiture over here, but then it's kind of looking away, so it's kind of moving away from identity of the face and you have the masks, so you kind of have that thread. Throughout. Yeah. This, in a way, we can um, say, using the kind of cliche expressions in the archaeology of the contemporary, if, in a way. So uh, she moves from the cer certain uh, archetypal aspect of a mask uh, we all uh, can connect to through our traditions of religion and uh, ritual. It is, in a way, a ritual she's playing out here. And then uh, this mask, this main surface of identity, we end up the identity politics with is something that is becoming uh, more abstract. So you see uh, the kind of shift between the languages uh, from uh, those historical positions of Bertelmann, Sterbach and uh, Natalia LL to, uh, to this subjective language that tries to uh, um, introduce a, a sort of new vocabulary that speaks more collective language. Um, I think uh, this uh, aspect is uh, very important for many artists that are represented by Animal na Gallery, um, the, the kind of uh, plea for um, a new language uh, of expression uh, by mainly young artists. I, say the young, I think the young voice is very appealing and very interesting and, and it's nice to kind of start watching it now. It's a very young voice, and this is why this young voice received a prize, which I cannot disclose what kind of prize, because it's not official yet. But uh, you're going to um, uh, learn in, two, in two, one hour and a half uh, <laughs> what prize it's going to be. So I'm really very happy and uh, uh, that, that we conclude this uh, tour with you here at this uh, uh, position which really promises the future. It's very much directed towards what comes next. Absolutely, and I think to kind of start where we did with historical and end with a current is, is yeah. perfect. And you know, we can now build so many different narratives. And now when I look at this through the lens of uh, what we analyzed earlier, Jana Sterbach and uh, Renate Bertelmann, there is something voyeuristic, there is something exhibitionistic here. This is a performance of the self as well. Yeah? Yes. And I think it's uh, beautiful you know, how uh, the work of one artist can be enriched by our experience of the work of another artist. Yeah? And uh, it's incredible that within this very close neighborhood, we have those positions of different generations females. within females, within a more or less a similar uh, cultural background, although the fact that she spent some time in Sao Paulo um, is, I guess, important. And here oh, your I sense so. and your I smell so. of uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the kind of maybe ritualistic, more mythological, um, softer aesthetic that is uh, maybe yeah. typical for the Latin America. Yeah. By the way, we can also speculate uh, to what extent uh, the work of uh, Latin American artists and the work of Eastern European artists operate as arms to uh, embrace Western art. And uh, this is the speculation that uh, I guess a, a year ago had been in a way materialized within the exhibition in MoMA where some Eastern European artists were juxtaposed with the artists from Central Eastern Europe. And there was a show recently at the Getty on concrete poetry and there were strong connections between Latin America and, and people that were in Eastern Europe. So I, I do think it's a thread that people will probably continue to look at. And I would like to ask Tracy, uh, what had been so far your experience of Artissima, because it's your first time here, and do you, what do you, uh, how do you like, do you, do you think that uh, this fair differs from other fairs you attended? Uh? I, I do. I think probably my first impression was the collectors that I spoke with and how educated they are and how researched they are. And prior to the fair opening, how much knowledge everybody had um, was really impressive and knowledge about galleries that I wasn't that familiar with and I go to a lot of fairs. So for me, that was very uh, impactful and that was really, really interesting. And again, it's also exposure to um, other galleries that, that I wasn't um, that familiar with. 
I can only agree with this and I can only hope that you also agree with it. Yes, the question. So, uh, you're collecting art and uh, what is the purpose of the collecting art? You say that in LA you uh, support artists, so local artists. And what about here in Artissima? If, uh, if you would pur purchase an artwork, do you want to uh, resell it later? you want to exhibit somewhere later? What do you do with, with the art that you collect? Um, the art that I collect is in my home and we entertain, so we have people coming all the time. To I, we, we like to share a home, we like to share our art. Um, and we also lend for exhibitions. I don't sell. Um, I, maybe one day I will, but I don't think so, because I don't, I don't buy it for market value, I don't buy it for investment, I buy it for me um, and my family, um, and we, we have it at the house. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and I want to thank you because this was a very serious tour. Uh, so bravo to you all. I'm very impressed. This just speaks again about the quality of even the audience in Artissima that you would go along on, a, on a, such a focused tour. I, I really want to thank um, Adam for sharing his expertise and uh, his commitment to this body of work which has always been in your academia and from the bottom of my heart my my gratitude to you Tracy for going along and opening yourself up to this experience you are a braver woman than I am I, I would have been intimidated to be um, with this man uh, so thank you so much so everybody big hand because this one was a serious one bravo to all of you